Hello, Brittany. Hey, Myra. How's it going? Good. I'm so happy to be here on the show with you again. It's been a while. I just can't stay away. I know. <laughs> you can't keep away, especially with topics as fun as this one. Ugh. This is my colleague, Brittany Patterson. And you may recognize her name here on Homegoings because she was our editor for season one. And yes, we are waxing a little sarcasm here when it comes to the fun we're about to dive into today. Because Brittany and I, we took on some pretty heavy topics together. And we're not about to stop now. She was there with me when we tackled what it means to be beautiful as a Black woman in America when held up against the beauty standard of whiteness. She eagerly unpacked the nuance of melanated partnership in our episode about Black love, and was side by side with me for an episode about a crisis for Black birthers. I think I speak for both of us when I say that one was particularly hard to make. Yeah, it was um, a really, it was a really tough one to see this, the the science, see how much, how do I put this? See how badly our healthcare system fails black women if it's been a while since you listened to that episode or you haven't heard it i highly recommend you check it out the cliff notes are basically this back in the 1830s a slave owner named dr thomas hamilton performed what he called the hamilton experiment where he used to repeatedly whip beat and otherwise torture one of his enslaved people, John Brown. He did this in an effort to prove that black skin went deeper, that we felt less pain. And this idea is not a 19th century relic. According to a survey conducted by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, in 2016, that's 2016, more than half of first and second year medical students actually believe that black people's skin is thicker than white people's. The fallout from this belief has gone on to affect treatment or lack thereof of black people when they're in high risk situations like birth. To this day, in 2024, black birthers and their children are three times more likely to die, essentially because of the ongoing effects of racism. And this is just one story about the black body, medical experiments, and the repercussions of them to this day. There's more. Too many to fit in this episode. And by the early 20th century, the cultural and medical landscape of the U.S. was swimming in racist waters. And these horrific concepts about race and science began trickling down to the way average, everyday Americans perceived black people. Into the ways we were stereotyped. And there's one stereotype I want to talk with Brittany about today. My father is from the South, and I recognize now, like, very, very racist. Um, really nice person. Such a great dad. But grew up, like, hearing that Black people were inferior and passed that down to his kids. Here on Homegoings, we're three weeks into our special series on stereotypes and the people who have managed to escape their harmful effects. We've talked about the myth of the deadbeat dad and the myth of the scary black man, but today's stereotype is particularly scary because just like this idea about black people in pain, for the longest time, it wasn't a myth. It was a medical, scientific fact that black people were stupid. It was also common knowledge around Brittany's breakfast table. My grandparents are really well-educated, upper-middle-class people. Um, they are, they're immigrants to this country, um, but both veterinarians, my grandfather is a scientist, like, have a lot of schooling. And, and they were always very much like, education is the key to unlocking success in this world. And I took that very, very seriously. I have this very visceral memory of having breakfast with them. And we were a very combative, conversational family around the kitchen table. And it came up that, no, 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 science has proven it. Black people are not as smart as white people. And I remember my grandfather saying this and 
he had read it in the news. And he was like, no, I, I, it was studied. It was proven. I, I read about it. It must be true. And I remember thinking, well, God, if science said that, it must be true. And kind of just like tucked that away. Brittany is talking about a study performed by James Watson, the 1962 Nobel laureate, who let it be known that he was, quote, inherently gloomy about the prospect of Africa, end quote, because, quote, all of our social policies are based on the fact that their intelligence is the same as ours, whereas all the testing says not really, end quote. This is 1962. And Dr. Watson's remarks were at least controversial enough during this time to raise some counter-studies about the genetic differences between the brain size and intelligence levels of black and white brains. Harvard, Berkeley, psychologists, and more dove right in to find out if it was true. Surprise, surprise, it wasn't. And if there is any evidence concerning an IQ difference between black and white people, it's proven to be environmental. You know, that thing that also includes things like privilege, legacy and other forms of advantage. So, not genetic. Take that racism. Also, ugh, it's hard to know that even with data and evidence, these stereotypes, like all black people are stupid, you know, the thing that these studies sugar down to, these persist. And not just because they come from science or legend or from the mouths of the people we love, it's because of D. All of the above. I think absolutely what my very well-educated grandparents thought to be true and told me to be true. I'm sure I took that into my life as I started to branch out. Um, yeah, you know, I've um, I've done a lot of work just in general around the relationship that I have with my family. This was challenging for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think in the course of that work, I thought a lot about things that I was told when I was younger that aren't true. And I'm still unlearning, I think, a lot of the legacy of, of what it is that, that I was passed down. You've worked with me now for about three and a half years, I think it's coming up on. Do you think I'm stupid? Oh, God. No. <sighs> no. No. It's such a weird, hard world that we live in. From Vermont Public, this is Homegoings. I'm Myra Flynn, and today is part three of a four-part series we're calling Stereo Antitypes. And to be transparent, this series features all men. This wasn't on purpose, this was just where my research led me. A lot of these most troubling, most profound, most dangerous stereotypes apply to black men. Shocking, I know. So, for the better part of 2024, I've been chatting with four black men about the stereotypes that have been applied to them their whole lives. Stereotypes like, all black fathers leave. Like even though my dad is full of shit, I wish he were around, you know? All black men are scary. You can take the black man out the hood, but you can't take the hood out the black man. All black men have huge. The person was like, oh, I knew it would be big. And I was like, why, like, what makes you say that? And today's stereotype, all black people are stupid. People were saying like, oh, you speak well for somebody who's from Africa. How did you learn to speak English? And they didn't even appreciate the fact that I could speak, I could speak two other languages. This is Homegoings. We're a proud member of the NPR Network. Welcome home. Hi. 
I want to tell you about a new series called Reimagining Democracy for a Good Life with me, Angela Glover Blackwell. In it, I turn to organizers and leaders doing work on the ground in Los Angeles to see how they're trying to build a radically inclusive, thriving, multiracial democracy that serves everyone. I believe that is the key to human flourishing. Lessons from L.A. can inform a vision for the nation. Find Reimagining Democracy for a Good Life now wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, hello. Back in February, Homegoings threw a live event with some of the artists we feature here on the show. The event had a sponsor named the Vermont Professionals of Color Network, or as we lovingly call it, VTPOC. Tina Rutinera, one of the network's co-founders, got up and spoke from the heart about what it meant to support Homegoings. What he said completely blew me away. Uh, My dear Vermont community, and in particular, my community of beautiful sun-kissed people, it is both an honor and a privilege to stand here before you representing the Vermont Professionals of Color Network, an organization whose mission is to improve the experience, the representation, and success of black, indigenous, and people of color in the state of Vermont. This work is not easy. And I'm constantly reminded that we are trying to solve a 400-year-old problem. And I'm always looking back, wondering how difficult and challenging it must have been for those heroes of our past who stood up tall in their truths. Thank God we are able to learn from the tapestry of stories from these giants, woven with threads of resilience, love, sacrifice, and legacy. I mean, come on. That speech was tear-worthy for sure. But it wasn't just Tino's speech that captured me. It was Tino himself. He stood on stage, beautifully dressed in what looked like linen, jewelry, and other forms of wearable art. And it's hard to describe, but he looked like what he sounded like. The warmth in his face and his mannerisms matched the warmth of his words. I reached out to him immediately after the performance. You're just one of those people that I, I could like smell that you have an interesting story. I don't know why. I just could feel it. I was like, I want to know more. Yeah. Yeah. So I came to the United States as a refugee in 2000. And, um, you know, I fled uh, the political situation in Zimbabwe that was happening at the time. Uh, and I am calling you from Burlington, Vermont. Slightly different than Zimbabwe. Slightly different, just down 89, kind of hang a left, and then you just keep going south. <laughs> and you keep going. And then just keep going and going and going. I had to, to go to school in Zimbabwe. We had apartheid, just like South Africa had, and we had to have English names to use at school and stuff. And so my school transcripts had Charles as my first name, and yet all my legal documents, my passport, birth certificate had to know Tinder. And so coming here to America where nobody recognized my university credentials, um, I had to kind of go through this sort of uh, process of trying to explain to people that, you know, there is a system called apartheid to begin with and why, you know, we had, I had Charles as my first name on my uh, school transcripts. And so that led to situations where I couldn't even get a job uh, just because of that. On top of that, you speak, you come here, you speak with an accent. All of these things, the mismatch between Tino's passport and his transcripts, his accent, his skin color in a state that was predominantly white, meant that Tino was a perfect fit for the stereotype about Black people lacking intelligence. I mean, everybody just assumed that, you know, because I was coming here as a, as a refugee, that I was automatically not smart. And people would ask about, you know, stupid things like, you know, do they have, you know, cars in, in Africa, you know, or why are you so dark, you know, in dark in complexion, you know, and, you know, there was a there was a woman that even, you know, wanted to know, like, like, you know, do you guys, you know, tan and 
does the sun burn you? Can you just sit in the sun? And on top of that, they don't uh, recognize your university because it's some university down in deepest, darkest Africa. And so therefore, whatever qualifications you're coming here with, they don't apply to, to, to them. You're not smart enough. You don't, we don't think your education system is elite enough. And yet I can tell you, I can pretty, like, I'm pretty damn smart in, in, in terms of comparing the, the level of education that I got in Zimbabwe and in university, I think is a lot higher than the level of education that I'm seeing sort of kids coming out of high school and into college are getting here in the U.S. Tino says that in Zimbabwe, students begin taking national exams in the seventh grade. They continue to take them every two years from seventh grade all the way up to their 13th year of high school. And each exam advances students in a pretty monumental way. The seventh grade exams graduate them to high school. In sophomore year of high school, those exams grant them a Zimbabwe junior certificate. In their fourth year of high school, they can take an exam called the Cambridge Ordinary Level Exam, and in their sixth year, the Cambridge Advanced Level Exams, which are adjuncted by Cambridge University. That's 13 years of education before university. So yeah, when Tino arrived to America, his intelligence was not the problem. With all of this schooling, plus... The fact that he went to South Africa and obtained a Bachelor of Commerce and Business and Information Systems at Rhodes University, you would think Tino arrived in America and got anything he wanted. And still, no one would hire him. Um, So for the first uh, three years of my existence here in the United States, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get any sort of good paying job, really. Um, I worked, you know, in different sort of low entry level jobs. Like I worked in uh, filings in the mall, uh, folding clothes. I, you know, I worked in a daycare. I worked in housekeeping at a at the Radisson. You know, I was a dishwasher at you know at a local restaurant. And this was me sort of trying to figure out like how do I get people to even accept my credentials? And so I had to actually go start going back to school to do uh, more computer science qualification classes in order to convert my current degree into a U.S. accredited degree. And um, it was so I was working probably 16, 17 hours a day and going to school just in order to kind of showcase my skills. Tino says even beyond all of his schooling and his three jobs, he had other skills to learn like how to avoid the dangers that come by way of simply existing as a Black man in America. Just being harassed by the police, that happened to me quite a bit in, you know, my early days here uh, in the U.S. Um, You know, again, it was just, I didn't know if it was because I was Black, uh, because at the time when I first came to the U.S., um, for me, it was just about being in the United States. That was the blessing. And I really thought to myself, like, wow, you know, I'm so grateful to be here. And yet I didn't recognize a lot of the racial and racism things that were happening to me because I was just so grateful to to be out of the situation I was in in Zimbabwe and to be here. So when things like microaggressions were happening, when, you know, people were saying like, oh, you speak well for somebody who's from Africa, you know, and, you know, where did you, how did you learn to speak English? And they didn't even appreciate the fact that I could speak, I could speak two other languages outside of English, you know, they, for them, it was just about like, you are amazing me because you're a black person and because my view on black people is so, is so limited, you've surpassed that. And so therefore I feel obligated to, to, uh, to gush you with praise. And for me, I didn't really understand that uh, because again, I was really just excited about the fact that I was in the land of opportunity and, And this was an opportunity for me to sort of grasp sort of the American dream. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. 
the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. These are the words penned by Emma Lazarus on our Statue of Liberty. Some see these words as a national anthem of sorts, others as a kind of national curse. Because historically, once America actually receives the diversity of folks it solicits, becomes a place of refuge, for instance, for people like Tino, assimilation becomes the expectation with zero emphasis on integration. You feel me? And that's a problem because jobs in America are kind of a big deal. We're pretty much defined by what we do. So with Tino, this was really stunting in his journey for nobody to truly see him for who he was, what he did and what he could offer. And even worse, nobody in positions of power would help him get there. You know, never mind the fact that I could speak English, you know, I was quite articulate. Um, nobody felt the sense of like, how should I, uh, you know, how can this person maybe better our organization or our, our uh, establishment? When we come back, someone finally sees Tino at one of his jobs, which allows him to embark on a whole new journey in America. And it all started in a deliciously surprising way. One of the big lessons I learned was the, the art of making good sandwich. That's right after this. HomeGoings has support from Rutland Regional Medical Center, rooted in the commitment to equitable and inclusive healthcare access for all patients. Learn more at rrmc.org. And by the Vermont Arts Council, working to center creativity, art, and culture for everyone throughout Vermont. Learn more about programs, resources, and grant opportunities at vermontartscouncil.org. Welcome back to Home Goings. And if you're a longtime listener, a homie, you know that sometimes I like to quote my mom on this show. She has all these awesome sayings I was raised with. And when it comes to working a job, my mom has a particular one that's always stuck with me. She says, you do what you have to do until you don't have to do it anymore. In other words, don't be picky. And also, whatever you're doing, do it the very best you can. For thousands of people who migrate to America every year, they do what they have to do, but not always what they want to do, nor is it the only thing they're capable of doing, as was the case for Tino Rutanira, my guest today. Right now in Tino's story, this is the year 2000, and Tino has moved to the U.S. from Zimbabwe as a refugee. He's finding himself ensnared in the nasty stereotype about Black people and how we're all lazy and stupid. And this bias is showing up in his jobs because people are refusing to hire him for his skills, which are specifically in a little-known field called computer science. So at this point in the story, Tino is doing what he's got to do and working at a deli in Burlington, Vermont. I want to show you how to make a killer sandwich. The key is to not make anything, dominate anything else. So we got some bread. Go ahead and take a little bit of honey mustard. Next, we're going to go for the salami. I happen to love salami for some reason. Tomatoes on there. And actually, that was one of the things that kept me going, was I knew what I was worth, and I knew that at some point, somebody would notice. And so this gentleman who worked at the bank noticed, uh, would come in, order his sandwich, and he actually then just kind of took a liking to how I made sandwiches. Uh, the way I make sandwiches is I don't want any part of the sandwich to be more overbearing than anything else. Make sure you don't put too much bread, too much um, meat on it, don't put too much dressing, et cetera, et cetera. And so, this guy was like, wow, you, you take such meticulous care on making sandwiches. I love the way you, you, you know, have professionalism in the way you're doing this, the way you conduct yourself in the deli, you know. And so over time, he just wanted to know a little bit more about me, you know, tried to establish kind of like a, a friend relationship with me and got to know a little bit of my story. And I said, well, I am originally from Zimbabwe. I've, got my, I've gone to university before I came to the United States. I've got a degree in computer science. 
And so he's like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Why are you working in a deli? And I said to him, I, I don't, don't know. know. He then came back about a week later, told me to get my resume ready. And then he um, basically told me that there was a teller position that was available at the bank. And I was like, okay, yeah, that sounds good to me. And that is how everything sort of started unfolding. And that's how I really kind of got my entry into the professional space in the United States. Tino got his resume together quickly, sent it over, and within a week, he had an interview at the bank. A couple days after, the bank offered him a job as a teller. Not a computer science job, but that didn't matter. He was finally being seen for the professional he was and the professional he could become, because this job didn't really have a ceiling when it came to opportunity. The manager of the help desk found out that I had a computer science degree. She found out that I was goes going to school to to continue converting my my degree and she basically said like nope I don't care I want you on my team because you clearly got the skills for for what I need uh, which was the IT help desk um I then switched jobs to that got a little promotion pay bump and then about six months later the uh, application support manager who, so that's kind of a level above uh, the help desk, was like, I've heard a lot about you. I love the work that you're doing. I want you working on my team. And so that kind of thing happened to me over the course of maybe the next two years where I was no longer this kid that was trying to make ends meet. I was now Michael Jordan, no longer in street clothes but now on the court, showcasing my skills. So there you have it. Tino's rags to IT story is quite literally the American dream. He pulled himself up by his apron strings and has gone on to work at other large corporations like Dealer.com and Cox Automotive. He acts and plays, performs stand-up comedy, and he's a single parent to his 18-year-old daughter. And this is a beautiful story, but it's also one that makes me think a lot about privilege. Even Tino's privilege, his ability to hustle this hard, was a privilege not everyone has. He was young, bright, able-bodied, and had the capacity to take on so much work to accomplish these goals, eventually. It makes me wonder about the people who simply can't do these things. How do they get where they want to be in life? Also, if Tina were born white in America with community, connections, and some form of legacy behind him, this story of success would just be a story about life. Only it would have started fresh out of high school. You get a job, then you go to college, then you get another job until you do what it is you really want to do. Simple as that. The fact that it still takes people of color, immigrants especially, all of these extra years to simply be seen to prove our worth, to prove our intelligence. It's sad. So I had to ask, did you ever get pissed? Did you ever, I don't know, did you ever wonder, is this true? Like, am I only worth this here? Or, you know, why didn't you fight back? So no, actually the reason, and and only in hindsight, because for me, again, it was about being in the United States of America, the land of opportunity. At the time, I was just trying to establish myself and to show my credentials that I didn't fight back. I didn't think about the fact that, you know, these people were being racist towards me. It was only now that I'm looking back and I feel comfortable in who I am and in the situation. I'm thinking to myself like, wow, you know, like I should have been promoted when I applied for that job. And I should have, you know, called people out for being racist. The white supremacy culture is something that I'm starting to really sort of appreciate in, in, a, in a way that I hadn't previously. And, and not to say that the, 
like people that overlooked me that were my bosses that overlooked me for promotions i i applied for for promotions often and i often in fact most of the time didn't get them you know it i don't think they themselves were racist but i think the inherent privilege that they have in wanting to promote their own or to to advance people that look like them that feel like them that does make those acts racist Do you think there's anything about you that's stupid? Absolutely not. I mean, I think it's all about opportunities and and when again back to sort of white supremacy and and privilege. When you think about the opportunities that white people got, they were in fact they are the stupid ones for thinking that there's any difference other than the pigmentation of your skin, right? And so when you think about like opportunities like the GI bill that gave maybe not so intelligent white people opportunities to advance in life when you think about you know uh, how people will right now there's probably somebody on a golf course at a country club advocating for their son or their nephew who's white to get a particular job or to to get connected that's got nothing a lot of the privileges that white people get has got nothing to do with their smarts it's really to do with their connections and their privilege and so the fact that the black community doesn't get opportunities like that we don't control the gears and the wheels of industry and commerce like white people do when you think about you know the fact that there's what like five black ceos for in the fortune 500 companies like It's about being given opportunities. Would you say it's all thanks to a sandwich? <laughs> It is a thousand percent all thanks to a sandwich. I mean, without that, I don't know. Maybe eventually somebody else would have taken notice, but this was what really opened the doors for me and allowed me to then realize that, like. This is what life is like. You need people in your life to open doors for you. And when that door opens, you need to be ready to actually be able to walk through that door and show the world who you are and how you how you can kick ass basically. Tino Charles Rutinera. Thank you for speaking with me and for sharing your story with us. I for one find you freaking brilliant. And as you know here homies here on the show, we do our best to save time for a deep listen to something profound or artful at the end. If you head to our socials at we are homegoings, you can catch Tino performing his art of making a perfect sandwich. But here in this episode, I'd like to share Tino's answer to my final question from our interview together. as a deep lesson. It's a question about change, and Tino's answer is pretty profound. How do we stop this narrative that all black people are stupid? It's stuck around, it's lingered for such a long time. It it seems no matter how many degrees we get or you know what we do, it still lingers. How do how do we stop this? Wow. <sighs> I think it is up to white people to to know and understand that you know ah, gosh hmm that's a tough question myra because i don't know why like racism exists to begin with why you would see yourself as better than somebody else because that person has a different complexion to you. Um it's baffling to me because like everything else in society like we've shown that like black people are capable. You know, we've had black presidents, black vice presidents, black, like black CEOs and yet this this uh, this thing that started happening 400 years ago where people thought at that time were were able to cross seas and go and 
barter for, for people's bodies that 400 years later, people still think that, you know, you're, you're better than another race just because of something that happened 400 years ago. Like, that was then. Like, now people should be informed enough to know that there's no difference. To know that, like, we can all, like, we should all coexist and we're all part of a single human race. Um, I don't know, like, it's, it's a difficult thing for me to answer because I don't know why anybody would be racist to begin with. And I know people have benefited from racist systems. And I know individually people may benefit, but it's, I think it's the systems that exist that make it so complicated to unravel and undo. And by virtue of participating in those things, I think white people have potential to perpetuate racism because they benefited. And there's not a whole lot that a lot of people can do to say, no, I don't want to benefit from that. And I think at the end of the day, them creating equity is something that I think challenges them because it feels like they're, they're losing. And yet they've been benefiting for 400 years. It's like the example of Sorry, I'm going on here, but it's an example of like a parent that used to give their kid, like has two kids. One get, used to get four cookies, the other used to get zero cookies. And then somebody says to the parent, like, why would you do that? Like, you should, you know, be a lot more fair. And, and now the parent decides, okay, well, I'll give this other kid three cookies and I'll give the other kid one cookie. And... I think what's happening with white people when they when they start getting three cookies instead of four, they feel like this is unfair. It's like, why am I losing out? And yet it's not a losing out. You're trying to balance things and it's not a zero sum game. They don't have to be winners and losers all the time. And I think that's the myth that America as a whole has perpetuated, particularly perpetuated, particularly in the last like four years, five years or so, where the you know success for black people must come at the at the expense of white people and that's not true like the american pie is big enough for all of us and there shouldn't be this like us versus them syndrome that that exists today the american sandwich is big enough for all of us <laughs> the american sandwich yes Thank you so much for listening to Homegoings. It's been a pleasure being here with you. As mentioned, this is the third part of what we're hoping will be an ongoing series for us here on the show called Stereo Antitypes. We have one more part dropping next week before returning to our regularly scheduled bi-monthly episode drops. But if you have a suggestion of a stereotype that we haven't addressed yet here on the show, write to us at hey and homegoings.co. We'd love to hear from you and perhaps this series will pop up again in season three. This episode was mixed and reported by me. We also had help on a multitude of things from our associate producer, James Stewart. Saeed T. John Thomas Jr. and I edited this episode and I composed our theme music. All other music is by Miles Hooper and Blue Dot Sessions. Our Homegoings artist portrait was graphically crafted by Zoe McDonald. Tino is front and center on this one, looking all professional and stuff. Check him out at homegoings.co. See you next week. That's right, next week for the final part of our Stereo Antitype series as we tackle a myth most people won't even talk about. It's the myth of the big black penis. There, I said it. And yeah, we're going there. So guard the ears of the ones you love if you need to, or join me for a trip down a problematic road that predates slavery, is perpetuated in porn, and really combines all of the stereotypes we've talked about in this series into one big culmination. If you have thoughts, reflections, or asks of me as your host about who we should talk to or what we should explore next on the show, write to me at hey at homegoings.co. As always, you are welcome here. Every episode of Brave Little State begins with a question about Vermont that's been submitted and voted on by listeners like you. What happened to all the restaurant workers? What's the deal with Vermont's fire towers? 
Why do people like the band Fish? Follow Brave Little State wherever you get podcasts. From Vermont Public, part of the NPR Network.